Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well hello everybody uh, so i'm dr david unwin i'm a gp from just north of liverpool and i've looked after the same population of about 9000 patients all the way since 1986 I'm also a founder member of the Public Health Collaboration, uh, which is, of course, one of my favourite UK charities. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you uh, some of the highlights of eight years, it is now, of offering a low-carb approach to the patients at the Norwood Avenue surgery. Um, we're going to uh, include a quick revision of low carb in a nutshell. And uh, just like to point out, we're now uh, achieving 50% uh, drug free uh, type 2 diabetes remission for all the people who choose a low carb approach. We're going to go over some of the more interesting aspects of our most recent BMJ nutrition paper. As a most uh, special thing, a world premiere of uh, our real function uh, work at Norwood Avenue. We're going to look at the question of how to improve drug-free type 2 diabetes remission rates. And obviously, we've got to be talking about hope. So what are some hopeful things I've spotted in the, um, in the last year? But um, before we move on, I should just uh, go over my conflicts of interest. Uh, so in terms of uh, financial conflicts of interest, I don't have any. If I am paid uh, to do any of the low carb work, I donate that money either to the public health collaboration um, or um, our local hospice so that I never uh, keep any of the money for myself. In terms of conflict of interest, uh, it could be said that I'm biased for a low carb approach because I've been personally on a low carb diet ooh, for about nine years now. So I suppose I should declare that as a bias. Anyway, moving on. So uh, let's just talk about Roy. Here he is, uh, Roy, aged 73. And when he first came to me, um, he had a haemoglobin A1c uh, of 51, which puts him, as you see in the graph here on the right, in the diabetic category. And if we look at his haemoglobin A1c there, a measure of how sugary Roy has been, you will see that something happened here where the first question mark is to change his behavior. And that happened in a 10 minute appointment, a 10 minute NHS appointment. And so the question is, uh, what happened then? And then the next question mark marks what happened over the following couple of years, uh, where he managed to maintain his improvement. So that's another area of interest. 
So here's Roy uh, more recently. So proud and so changed. So he's taken control over his health. His blood pressure is normal. His blood sugar is normal. He's joined a gym. Uh, he's an amazing fellow. He's proud and I'm proud. So he marks one remission at Norwood Avenue. We've actually had, I think it's 95 cases of type 2 diabetes remission uh, now. And when you think I never saw that a single time uh, in the first two decades of my uh, life as a GP, and now I've seen type 2 diabetes remission on 95 occasions. So what are the important aspects of achieving this wonderful thing with our patients? The first thing uh, is the role of hope. And when he first came to me, that was what I gave him. I said, well, we may be diagnosing type 2 diabetes today, but the point is, if you're interested, changing your diet can make a huge difference. And in six months time, you could be in so much better shape than you are now. Is that something you're interested in? And of course he was. The other thing that's most important is to explain the advice we give to our patients in terms of physiology so that they can understand the role of sugar and insulin and so on. And then instead of memorizing a diet, they're in a position to understand why they would give up things like cornflakes or bread. So here is uh, my model now of type 2 diabetes. We're interested in blood sugar control because high blood glucose over time damages your arteries, leading to the problems with circulation, the problems with your kidneys and the problems with your eyes that people worry about with type 2 diabetes. So we want to lower blood glucose because a high one is dangerous over time. So the model we've got here is uh, there is glucose or sugar coming into the system and sugar leaving the system. And the balance between sugar in and sugar out is where your blood sugar or your blood glucose comes from. So when we look at where does blood uh, sugar come from? Well, obviously sugar itself, but rice, potatoes, cereals, all sorts of foods put up your blood sugar. If you're wanting to get rid of blood sugar, well, glucose out, exercise, excellent choice. But also the drugs, many of the drugs that we use to help with type 2 diabetes, get rid of sugar. Insulin obviously gets rid of sugar, and it does that by pushing the sugar into your muscles or pushing it into your belly or your liver. And in these places, it's often turned to fat. So insulin gets uh, puts your blood sugar down, but it also tends to make you heavier and can give you uh, a fatty liver. The new SGL2 inhibitor drugs cause you to wee out the sugar. So that's one way uh, to get rid of sugar. But what I really believe in is that um, it just makes more sense to turn off the supply of sugar. And there are different ways to do this. Fasting works very well, a very low calorie diet, the low carb diet itself, which I'll be talking about, and also bariatric surgery. All these things work and it's a matter of personal choice, which you prefer. Well, so I see really the fact that if you have type 2 diabetes, glucose or sugar becomes a kind of metabolic poison. So uh, you need to avoid sugar in all its forms. And the hemoglobin A1c is a measure of how sugary your diet has been. So I like asking my patients, and I'm doing this in every single clinic I run, where do you think the sugar comes from in your diet? And then it's obvious uh, what you should be giving up. The first priority is, of course, to give up table sugar. Uh, but so many people have already given up table sugar. And the question is, so where does the sugar come from in your diet if you're not having much table sugar? And the answer or clue here really is the starch molecule, because starch is glucose molecules holding hands and digestion will come along and break it back down into surprising amounts of sugar.
Many of you will be, uh, I hope, familiar with my teaspoons of sugar equivalent charts, where I'm helping you understand the uh, glycemic consequences of dietary uh, choices. So if we look here, 150 grams of boiled rice is going to affect your blood glucose approximately the same as 10 teaspoons of sugar. What a lot of sugar. Um, or in fact, if we look at boiled potatoes, 150 grams of boiled potatoes, roughly equivalent to nine teaspoons of sugar. And these charts help you understand the low carbohydrate diet because there are a lot of foods here uh, that don't put up your blood sugar. So that would be meat, fish, chicken, eggs, full fat dairy, all of the uh, green veg and nuts. All of these things uh, can be eaten and they hardly put your blood sugar up at all. So that would seem to make a lot of sense if you have type 2 diabetes. Uh, here is Matt Hancock, uh, who met me in Parliament and he likes my teaspoon of sugar equivalent, as you see. And he's also lost two stone uh, by going on the low carbohydrate diet. Far more recently uh, than that, we've had Boris Johnson himself on Twitter uh, this March uh, explaining to us all that he's losing weight and he's doing it by uh, eating less carbs. Well, hooray for Boris. If you're interested in the uh, teaspoon of sugar equivalents, they're now translated into 14 different languages and can be found on the PHC website. So you could just Google sugar PHC and unwind to get straight there. Uh, none of them are copyrighted. I do hope you'll look at those and uh, use them yourselves. This is the diet sheet we've been uh, using at Norwood Avenue uh, all these years. Uh, Basically, we're saying turn the white stuff green, the rice, the bread, the potato. Instead of that, have lots of green stuff, but increase your protein and moderately increase your healthy fats. Well, the paper. This uh, is, is our latest paper from Norwood Avenue, published in the BMJ Nutrition. Uh, with help uh, from Professor Shimon Ray from Cambridge University and the other people you see here. I'm immensely proud because the uh, paper has gone right up into the uh, medical top 10. And this is measured by the altmetric score, the attention score. And uh, so uh, this score looks at all of the papers ever published. And our low carb paper, I'm so proud, it's in the top 5% of all papers ever published in terms of its impact and the number of people who've downloaded it. Um, I should uh, give thanks here to the Public Health Collaboration because one of the things they do with the charitable funds that I hope you donate is they help pay for open access of interesting papers like this one. Um, in order for all of you to read the paper, if you wish, it actually cost thousands of pounds. And the PHC, in this case, funded my paper, and I'm uh, so grateful. Um, as part of this, if any of you wish to see the diet sheet, the um, Norwood uh, nurse protocol, or many of the extra materials, they're all filed and stored on the BMJ Nutrition as a supplementary file to the paper itself. So I do hope uh, some of you will have a look at the paper, but if you don't want to, here are the, uh, the headlines uh, from uh, this, this paper. So we analyzed our data, and at this point, we were getting 46% drug-free type two diabetes remission at an average of 23 months low carb. So this is of all the people that chose uh, low carb at Norwood Avenue, 46% uh, of at this point in time um, achieved drug-free diabetes remission. We were getting uh, and still do get significant improvements in blood pressure, weight and lipid profiles. Uh, there's the annual saving there on the drug budget. At that point, it was about £50,000. 
And here's an important point. If every GP practice in England spent the same on drugs uh, for diabetes as Norwood does, the country would save £277 million, which is astonishing. And this is the size of the drug budget in the UK. We're spending about a billion pounds per year on drugs for diabetes. This is amazing. And I feel a lot of it could be spent in a different way. Um, some of you will have heard me say before that older patients do just as well as the younger ones with a low carb approach. And because older patients tend to suffer from the side effects of medication, this is particularly important to many of our older people. The oldest person I've got who's gone low carb is, I think at the moment, 93 years old. And uh, I'm proud to tell you she's in drug-free diabetes remission, age 93, lives in her own home. Last The other day I rang up and she was out gardening. Um, here's a, a final point that the people with the highest blood sugars who uh, you might think ought to be using drugs seem to get the best improvements in hemoglobin A1c. So this is another very important finding. One of the things uh, that I was so pleased to publish, we've got uh, 71 people with prediabetes who chose a low carbohydrate approach. And when we looked at the data, 66 out of those 71 achieved normal blood glucose. So we're getting a remission rate of prediabetes of 93%. So hardly anybody um, who tries low carb at Norwood Avenue doesn't get a normal blood glucose. Again, astonishing and so full of hope. I'm really proud of that. Uh, this is the uh, box and whisker chart to show you the statistics of this. So the populations change majorly uh, between baseline and latest follow-up. Um, and the average weight loss for the people with prediabetes was 8.4 kilos. This is the uh, data for the 128 people, as it was at that point, with type 2 diabetes on a low-carb diet for 23 months. And again, the before and after are totally uh, different in terms of the hemoglobin A1c. So we're changing these patients' sugariness significantly. And one of the reasons this is so important is that the uh, JBS3 here uh, suggests that for every improvement in 10 millimoles, so for every 10 millimoles you improve your hemoglobin A1c, you're getting a 10 to 15% reduction in cardiovascular disease events. So when we look at the average improvement in hemoglobin A1c at Norwood Avenue, where we're getting a 17.5 millimoles per mole improvement, the cardiovascular disease risk reduction is in the order of uh, 17 to 26 percent. So it's not just about diabetes, uh, it's more important than that. A quick update. Um, this is now, we now have a case series of 186 people with type 2 diabetes who've been on a lower carb diet. Um, it's actually over 30 months now. It's, I think, 33 or 34 months. Uh, when I did this slide, 94 of these, or 50%, had achieved drug free uh, diabetes remission. Dr. Tobin messaged me, I think, two days ago. He's found another, so we've got 95 people now in uh, drug-free type 2 diabetes remission. And look, so we're getting significant improvements in hemoglobin A1c, cholesterol, HDL cholesterol is improving, the cholesterol ratio improves by 11%, triglycerides improving by 34%, weight average loss is 10%, blood pressure 12 millimeters of mercury, the diastolic improves by six millimeters of mercury, and the liver function, as reflected by gamma GT, improves on average by 48% for these people who go low carb. So astonishing uh, uh, results, and uh, it gives me joy, really. 
Uh, just to confirm here, I checked the other day on are we still saving money on the drug budget? And as you see, of all the local practices, this is um, open prescribing data. Uh, all of the local practices, we are by far the cheapest saving. The update is we're now spending £58,000 per year less than is average for our areas. So, uh, looking at the eight-year data at Norwood Avenue, uh, we're getting uh, significant improvements in weight, haemoglobin A1c, blood pressure, liver function, liver profiles. I don't know why I've said age there, that's an error. Uh, we're not making people, uh, we're not making people younger. So those are all the things we've studied so far. But what about renal function? Uh, renal function is very important for people with type 2 diabetes, as I explained earlier, because of damage to the microcirculation, renal function tends to deteriorate for people with um, type 2 diabetes. So it's something we monitor very closely. And in fact, I was quite worried um, in uh, November 2019 in the uh, magazine Medscape there was um, a piece talking about high protein diets could be harmful, even for people with healthy kidneys. And um, well, what about people with type 2 diabetes? So this worried me because, of course, if you're on a low carb diet, you've replaced the carbs either um, with protein or with fat. So many people on a high uh, on a low carb diet are having a higher protein diet. So if this was actually true, uh, it would be a significant clinical worry. And I decided right then we needed to go back over all the data and check on the renal function for the people at Norwood Avenue. Uh, I looked at a few cases and it seemed as if the renal function improved. So this is a, a particular individual. Um, who I've been monitoring for nine years. So this is somebody who's had drug-free remission of their type 2 diabetes for nine years. So the top graph is showing the hemoglobin A1c, the sugariness of their blood. And you can see the low-carb diet in this case started in 2011, and the sugariness has been really normal ever since. But look below, the second graph is looking at one of the um, ways we measure renal function, kidney function. We look at the urinary albumin creatinine ratio. And those of you with diabetes will know that we check your urine once a year and we're looking for albumin or protein and checking that you're getting rid of the uh, creatinine. And in this case, uh, the renal function all those years ago was really poor really poor and um, in this case was so uh, poor it wasn't thought safe to use uh, metformin but you can see having gone low carb the renal function as reflected by the albumin creatinine ratio has improved dramatically but this is just an n equals one just an example but here's a, a, a separate uh, case. One of the other functions, uh, the way we measure renal function, is something they call the EGFR. And this is something else that all of you with diabetes will have uh, measured on a, a regular basis. So this is another individual. And uh, back a few years ago, the renal function was so poor that patient, uh, it wasn't safe for them to have metformin. And so they were given uh, both insulin and liclozide to try and sort out the sugariness of their blood. Um, luckily, I, I got at them. And in fact, the person on a low carb diet managed to come off both insulin and liclozide and has um, uh, been free of uh, drugs now for two years. But look at the renal function. In this case, up is good because the renal function has recovered to normal. So this is another N equals one, which is reassuring, um, but doesn't really tell us what's happening to the whole population. Um, so 
renal function should we worry? Of course, my average patient with type 2 diabetes is about 63 years old. And so even in terms of age, their kidney function is starting uh, to deteriorate. And we know that we would normally expect uh, renal function in terms of eGFR, the thing I've already mentioned to you, it ought to, it would deteriorate by one mil per minute per 1.73 meters squared of body surface. So it would go down per year by about one mil. That would be what we'd expect. In the context of type 2 diabetes, we might expect it to deteriorate on average even faster than this. So imagine my relief uh, when uh, we got the statistics on uh, the entire cohort uh, to discover that instead of renal function deteriorating on average, it actually improved. Hooray! How reassuring. So for my cohort at Norwood Avenue, uh, there is a mean improvement in uh, EGFR of 2.4. Uh, this is over 30 months that they've been on the low carb diet on average. So if we compare the one mil that it ought to go down per year against an improvement of 2.4 over over two years, you can see this is reassuring. And um, so if we, we look at the pie chart of what actually happens here to patients, 29% uh, had uh, did record that the kidney function wasn't quite as good over the 30 months. But 67% of all of the cohort showed an improvement. And the balance of the two gives an average improvement in creatinine, another measure of renal function of 4.71 there. So we're getting average improvements in renal function, not deterioration. And um, as far as I know, in the real world of, of primary care medicine, uh, this has not been recorded uh, anywhere in the world. And uh, we have submitted this for publication, and I'm hopeful uh, that the current opinion in endocrinology and diabetes uh, will be publishing this. The preliminary report is they're very interested, and I think they will uh, publish this because the world needs to know uh, that in the real world of primary care, uh, as we've done low carb at Norwood Avenue, the renal function is not a worry. In fact, it improves. So, so, so important and encouraging. Um, I promised you at the beginning, we'd, we'd think a little bit about type 2 diabetes, drug-free remission. And uh, so this was a case I mentioned to you earlier, nine years. Hooray. And over the time, we are getting better and better at Norwood Avenue in helping our patients achieve type 2 diabetes drug-free remission. And that's because we're learning. We're constantly looking at our successes, but also at our failures and trying to think, what could we do better? And as a reflection of this, um, we've obviously keeping data as the time goes on. So let's have a look here. So the number of cases in remission at Norwood Avenue between March 2017 and March 2021 has gone up from 15 to 94 individuals. If we look at the remission rate for the people who choose the low carbohydrate diet, it's gone up from 31% to 50% because we're learning constantly. And it's so important that the lessons we learn at Norwood Avenue are spread around the, the world, really, uh, so that people don't have to learn um, from their mistakes, as we have, all over again. And the remission rate um, is quite interesting to look at the remission rate for the entire population. So we've actually got 9,600 patients now at Norwood Avenue. And within those, uh, we've got 473 people with type 2 diabetes. So we get about 20% of the whole population, now a fifth, um, into remission. And this is why we're saving so much money, because the figures are becoming better and better year on year. So we need to think about what lessons 
we can learn from clinical practice. Uh, this is my friend Chris, one of our patient experts, who's been uh, with us really from the very start, and he, we've learned a lot from his uh, case. And the most important thing is you see here, he achieved type 2 diabetes remission all those years ago, and then his sugariness, the hemoglobin A1c deteriorated. And it's so important to point out to clinicians don't always think at this point you have to medicate your patients. Just ask them again, where do you think the sugar is coming from in your diet? And Chris knew where the sugar was coming from in his diet, and he took action, as you see, and then his hemoglobin A1c was better than ever. And he uh, learned from his lessons and cut out whatever it was he was eating and achieved even better type 2 diabetes remission. And I should explain, this is Chris before, aged about 40, and this is him now. He's over 60 and fitter than ever, completely drug-free, uh, with an excellent blood pressure, liver function, lipid profile, and hemoglobin A1c. Uh, we wrote his case up in, in the BMJ itself. Now, this is uh, an interesting graph. This is one of my patients, and it's their weight between 2006 and 2021. So this is a person who is very heavy and then does something, and they lose weight wonderfully. But, oh dear, something happens, and the weight goes up again. This person uh, takes action and the weight goes down. But then again, something's happening and the weight bounces back up and down and up. And I know uh, that when I look at people who are heavy, this bouncing up and down is a phenomenon I see again and again. And many of you have lived all your lives with weight bouncing up and down. You bring it down with pure willpower, but something happens and then your weight goes up again. And uh, I was put this a graph, I think, on, um, on Twitter recently. And uh, an anonymous person said, uh, Dr. Unwin, those are the dragon's teeth of addiction. And when you look at it, you can see if you, they look like teeth. And I thought, what a wonderful way that so many of us are gripped uh, by uh, the dragon of addiction. And this patient uh, has shared with me uh, that the problem here is, is um, carbohydrate addiction, that um, over time, the willpower, something happens, and he goes back uh, to the food groups that he struggles to control. And this is the very reason that for so many of you, moderation is really, really difficult. And some of us have to cut out biscuits or whatever it is altogether because moderation is impossible. And this is one of the main things uh, that uh, my wife, Jen, who is a consultant clinical health psychologist, uh, and I have learned over the last few years. And some people need some very special help. Uh, with food addiction. And this is why, this is my lovely wife, Jen, and I know that she'll be talking to you this afternoon about what she's done um, to help people with addiction. And I think one of the important things she's done is written this book, uh, Fork in the Road. It's available on Amazon and all the profits are being donated to the charity, the PHC, so Jen hasn't written this book to uh, make us both rich. Um, she's written it to help people who struggle with food addiction. And she says to me, it's the book she wishes she'd read, oh, let's say 30 years ago. Uh, so please think about uh, buying Jen's book. And as I say, you're helping the PHC if you do. That's a shameless plug, I know. But I think it's a good book. So just back to, uh, we're coming to the end of the uh, talk now, a few points on hope from the year. 
uh, the Daily Mail did a, a low carb week. So the Daily Mail is the most popular paper in the UK. And there was an entire week of low carb recipes, low carb articles, all sorts of things. And I think in that week, I think I wrote about 20 separate um, articles for the Daily Mail. And the feedback was amazing, amazing. And uh, the, the Mail featured a number of my patients, uh, as you see, uh, with before and after photos. It was a great success, lots of hard work. Uh, but when the, a major UK paper is covering uh, the low carb story by devoting a whole week, uh, then I think this is hope. This is hope. I just um, would like to highlight one of the uh, pieces they wrote in the week about the growing army of doctors helping their patients. So it's really not the doctor on Rin show anymore. I've got lots of help. Thank heavens. And this is a piece written in the Daily Mail by uh, Judith Keeling about there are now endocrinologists, here's David Cavan, and lots of other GPs. These are friends of mine, Ruth and uh, Vipan, who are helping get the message out there. And I know now that 2,700 GPs have done my e-learning module published by the Royal College of General Practitioners on a, a low um, carbohydrate approach to type 2 diabetes. So we are making progress. Um, some days I'm frustrated, some days I'm full of hope. Uh, today is a hopeful day, we're doing well. Little final thing really, uh, there's a magazine called New Nutrition Business. And I noticed a few weeks ago, uh, they published a piece on looking at uh, consumer beliefs about carbohydrate. And apparently the percentage of people who uh, claim to be reducing their carb consumption is increasing. So they, they questioned thousands of people in five different countries listed there at the bottom. And almost a third of consumers are now trying to eat fewer carbohydrates. Amazing. And apparently women are more interested in reducing carbs than men. And this is part of the low carb keto trend. So this is uh, encouraging. And it's interesting. They also were looking uh, in this magazine article at the uh, types of food that people are eating less of. Obviously, sugar. Uh, definitely sugars going up the agenda, cakes, not surprising, bread, perhaps a little surprising, soft drinks, pasta, potatoes, rice. So uh, the message is getting out there and it's beginning to affect what's on the supermarket shelves, uh, a message of hope. Final slide. Um, so, oh, Marcia. Marcia, thank you so much, Marcia, for sharing this photo. This is Marcia when I first met her a few years ago, weighed nearly 100 kilos, aged 52. She'd been on insulin uh, for more than 10 years. And life for Marcia was difficult in so many ways. But look, wow, this is Marcia now. Uh, type 2 diabetes, wonderful hemoglobin A1c. She's been off her insulin for two years. Her blood pressure is amazing. But the most wonderful thing is Marcia has learned a great deal and she's so proud of what she's achieved herself. And I think it's just a great example of what can be achieved um, if healthcare professionals cooperate with their doctors, incorporate their uh, beliefs and wishes and the shared goals between doctors and patients. It can be wonderful medicine. And so that's really, uh, that's the end of my talk, my PH talk for 2021. I can't wait to meet you all again um, in person, but for now, this will have to do. Um, oh, that's just to remind you of her weight loss and no insulin. And there's the uh, references uh, for some of the papers we've uh, now uh, written. And so thank you so much. I do hope you've enjoyed my talk. And uh, don't forget to listen to all the others, particularly, of course, my wife, Jen. All the best. Bye-bye now. <laughs>